Welcome to the Read by the Author uh, podcast and YouTube show. I am here for the kind of like in betweeny season, season 1.5, with my dear author friend, Tara Benner, uh, who is going to be reading for the next four episodes her novella. It's a prequel novella um, for her Witches of Shadow Mountain, which I always, wait, no, yeah, no, Mountain, Mountain Shadow. Shadow. See, I always <laughs> screw it up. <laughs> Witches of Mountain Shadow. Um, contemporary fantasy series. Uh, the novella is so fun, um, which you guys will find out. It's like got a very supernatural feel um, with the brothers. And I'm really excited to share this with all of you. And um, I guess, Tara, can you, uh, well, welcome, first of all. <laughs> and Thank you. you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about the novella, Blood Ties? Yeah, so I came up with Blood Ties, the prequel, actually after I had written book one, because one of the brothers you'll meet, Wesley, he was always going to be a, a pretty big player in the series, but then his brother kind of came out of left field <laughs> and materialized, and it was the fall, and whenever it's kind of fall weather, I like to read a lot of mysteries, and I was thinking about these brothers, and um, I really... I love this idea that, you know, they've known each other their whole lives, but one of them is immortal and the other one is a supernatural. And his brother, Wesley, the mortal, doesn't know that his brother has this whole other double life that he's leading, killing supernaturals uh, who kind of get out of hand. And so, um, yeah, I wrote the novella to kind of tell their backstory before the two of them come to Mountain Shadow. Wesley comes there as a cop and Gabriel comes there to hunt down um, these this murderer who has been killing innocent mortals in Mountain Shadow. But before all that, they were living in Denver and Wesley was fighting crime there as part of the Denver PD and Gabriel was fighting supernatural crime kind of at night. So that is where the novella came from. And they both of them are central characters in the main series, but they're not... I know I've read the first yes. book. I'm going to read the whole series once it's out on audio. That's my thing. But um, Fiona and her sister, sister or sisters? Fiona and her sister are the main characters in book one of the main series. And yeah, Wesley and Gabriel, they're very important characters, but they kind of come into her world mm -hmm. and get swept up in, in the events in Mountain Shadow um, throughout the series. And, and they become much bigger players as the series continues. One of them is a love interest of hers. I would say, so. <laughs> um, what, um, what inspired you? So you said you wrote Blood Ties after you wrote book one, which is Ether Witch. Am I pronouncing that right? Mm -hmm. Ether Witch? Okay. Yes. Um, yes, Ether Witch. What inspired you to tackle the brothers kind of like what they're up to before um when you finish Ether Witch. Well, you know, it's just it's a really weird dynamic between them. And I think you kind of get that vibe when you read Ether Witch because, you know, Gabriel, the supernatural, comes and stays with Wesley in Mountain Shadow because Wesley has just come to town and moved there. And kind of from the outside looking in, from Fiona's perspective, you think you know, these brothers have kind of a strange dynamic because she is a witch and she can tell right away that Gabriel is a hunter mm. and witches and hunters are just natural enemies. And there's just kind of that weird dynamic because she knows that his brother has no idea what he is. And uh, so Fiona and Gabriel butt heads right away and they have this very antagonistic relationship. And so really, I, I was just so intrigued by kind of Gabriel and Wesley's history together. And I wanted to go back and kind of explore that in greater detail because Gabriel is one of those characters who doesn't always say what he's thinking, mm. but really he has this deep love for his brother and he's very protective of his brother, but his brother doesn't always even know all the ways that Gabriel's protecting mm -hmm. him and clearing supernatural obstacles out of his path. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it was really interesting in, um, well, as people will see in Blood Ties, you get to see that whole dynamic. That's, that's basically what it's about is that dynamic between them and like Gabriel kind of looking out for Wesley and Wesley, like unknowingly to himself getting into these supernatural situations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're at a serious disadvantage when you have supernaturals all around you. Yeah. You're the only one who doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. 
so the hunters um i thought it, first of all i thought they could like convention thing or i guess it was a it was like a was it a um solstice party or it was a anyway they had like a convention it was the was, equinox yeah events. the equinox but they can just the fact that they had this convention was hilarious there's like all these <laughs> these just like people selling their like super fancy crossbows and like motorcycles and stuff I thought that was great <laughs> all these that hunters. was one of my favorite scenes to write when he walks into the conference and it's just like everything you'd expect from a trade show except yeah. all these badass supernatural guys <laughs> looking at motorcycles and flamethrowers and yeah <laughs> So in that, um, you gotta have I, the right gear. Yeah. Right. In that, um, <laughs> and luckily the hunters have this like supernatural power to influence people to like, make them forget that they saw you at your conference. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is handy. Yeah. Uh, but in the story, you mentioned that the hunters are born that way. So they are a supernatural creature. And you also meant that they mentioned that they're like 95% male. So there's just not that many females mm -hmm. that are born or I'm assuming. Yes. <laughs> and this is, this is something that's kind of speculated about throughout the series, why they're predominantly men. Um, if it's just because most female hunters don't really make it through adolescence, kind of like the, mm. um, the evolutionary perspective, because it's really a dangerous, um, a dangerous line of work, not line of work, just a dangerous lifestyle in general. Or it's also hinted that maybe the brotherhood actually was killing the female hunters um, wow. when they were young because the I, hunters, in order to kind of keep repopulating their species, they have to mate with mortals. Like two hunters cannot oh. have a hunter child. And so to keep their species alive, male hunters have to mate with mortal women. And so if there are all these female hunters around, they would kind of pair up with each other yeah. and they'd have, you know, no new hunters being yeah. born. And so that's kind of speculated throughout the series, um, yeah. why they're mostly men. Well, that's but really interesting. At least one that we know of who's kind of a yeah. badass. So she is very <laughs> badass. And one of my questions, I'm going to get to her later, but, um, are, I was curious, are the, and this is probably stuff that's touched on later in the series and I'm totally going to read it. I'm very intrigued about that whole like hunter, male, female thing. So then talking about the female hunter that you mentioned, uh, Morgan, I absolutely adored her. I'm curious if she shows up later in the series. She does. Yay! And that was also not planned. Yeah. <laughs> that was also not planned because honestly, I cannot write a story if there's not some romantic elements. Um, but it's tricky because you don't necessarily want to give either brother a serious love interest before they come to the main yeah. series because as I mentioned one of them is going to be a love interest of Fiona's one or both of them I will say <laughs> uh, and uh and so it was tricky but I really did want there to be kind of that romantic element and also I mean just as like a consumer of books and movies and tv shows like sometimes my husband will be trying to get me to watch something I'll be like I don't want to watch that. It's all men. There's no mm -hmm. women in this. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I really, you know, the only woman was the villain. And so I wanted there to be kind of a badass female in this um, who could also um, kind of team up with Gabriel. And um, she just kind of popped into my head. And she is another character that really took on a life of her own because I never intended for her to be in the main series. But in fact, she does come into the main series and she makes a huge splash when she gets there in book, I believe it's book three that Morgan shows up. And uh, yeah, as you can imagine, uh, it, it does not go over well immediately because, and I think people who have read the main series but haven't read the prequel, they immediately hate Morgan when she mm. comes into the main series but she becomes much more likable as the series continues and she plays a really critical role mm. in the later books. So that's cool. Yeah. I really liked her character in this, but I can clearly see what you're talking about anticipating after like where stuff is going to be going later in the series. Um, I remembered my question from earlier, which is, um, are the, so the hunters are supernatural. Are they immortal or they're, um, 
are they're like not online. immortal. The only characters in my universe that are immortal are the vampires. Okay. Um, and I guess demons, I guess, but they're not really people. Uh, no, it's the hunters are not immortal, but they are like witches in the fact that once they get to be in their 30s, their aging slows down pretty dramatically. And so they never look their age once they get, you know, to be in their adulthood. Um, and witches are that way, you know, they just age much more slowly than mortals, but their lifespans top out, you know, around like 180. Mm, so. mm -hmm. Um, so then what are the, it's kind of like the standard supernatural fare in here. We've got vampires, we have werewolves, we have witches and demons. Are there other types of supernatural creatures in this world? In the series, it's alluded to the fact that there are other characters who don't risk really get any screen time. There's fae and dark elves and, um, orcs and things like that but they don't ever make an appearance the only supernaturals that really appear in the main series are witches hunters vampires werewolves demons and spirits so cool um okay so what would you say is your favorite thing about i mean you've been writing in this world for a couple of years now so what is your favorite thing about this world that you've created oh i know uh, it's a hard question <laughs> gabriel Gabriel is your favorite, my favorite thing. thing. <laughs> <laughs> I love Gabriel. Well, and, and Bellamy, who's in the main series. Um, I, I just love them, especially Gabriel, because he's very uh, sarcastic and kind of dryly funny. And, uh, you know, he has a good heart also. And uh, so, yeah, he's, he's my favorite, I think. But I also love kind of the quirkiness of the town of Mountain Shadow, um, which you won't see in Blood Ties, but you'll see in the main series, because uh, I grew up watching Gilmore Girls, and I love anything that takes place in a small town. Um, Haven was a favorite show mm -hmm. of mine for a long time, and so you always have those quirky characters in a small town who are mortals, and they don't really know what's going on, um, and then you have all the little small town festivals and people who think they're kind of a big deal, but they're just a big fish in a little pond. And so uh, I really enjoy that aspect of it as well. Cool. Um, okay. So what would you say were your main influences when you were, or what either influences or inspiration for creating this world in this series? Um, well, I it's Girls. hard to say because <laughs> it's hard to say because I, I've loved paranormal books and TV, um, you know, since I've been in high school, you know, I, I loved Twilight and the Vampire Diaries and True mm -hmm. Blood and all that kind of stuff when like the first wave of like when vampires mm -hmm. were cool. Um, <laughs> uh, but then more recently, you know, Patricia Briggs, I love her stuff. I love Lindsay Broker's books. Um, yeah, it's just, it all is kind of an amalgamation and you put all that input in and weird stuff comes out as yeah. far as like the the mystery <laughs> aspect the <laughs> blood ties and ether which both have a really strong kind of murder mystery thread and i i really love agatha christie and some kind of like cozy mysteries and this is not a cozy mystery whatsoever <laughs> in fact amazon thinks that it's supernatural horror for some reason oh uh, it sticks it sticks with urban do. fantasy in there too what's that it Amazon sticks my urban fantasy. Oh, in there too. Yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's not a cozy mystery, but I love mysteries as well. And so there's that element to the, the series. So cool. Um, okay. So uh, let's see. Um, we have on the cover, we see there's two guys. Um, do you, I'm assuming you have picked out in your head, which one is which brother on the cover? And do you feel like those are accurate I representations do. of yeah. them? They're not accurate representations of them, really. Um, just because I go to my cover designer and I give them, you know, like a description, but you're kind of limited by stock photography that it's available. The the brother with kind of the floppy, darker hair is Gabriel on the cover. Okay. And the more, I'm trying to picture the cover in my head. It's been a while. I'm going to pull it up. <laughs> and the Hold more on. clean cut, <laughs> the more clean cut brother is Wesley. Okay. So there's the one, the one's like kind of in the front and one's kind of in the back. They're like side by side. Uh, 
I might have to, I can get up and look on my bookshelf at the, at the cover, unless you have it, you want us to hold it up for me. All right, shiny phone. Here we are. Okay. Yeah. So the one in the front is supposed to be Gabriel, although he looks kind of like a werewolf a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of looks like, like this... um, he kind of looks like a combination between, um, Vampire Bill from, uh, True Blood and, <laughs> um, Sam Winchester. <laughs> From supernatural oh because i was thinking of wolverine but he does look like sam winchester <laughs> and uh isn't he the guy who plays dean on gilmore girls yeah yeah which is funny because yeah. his brother in supernatural <laughs> is named dean <laughs> uh, yeah so yeah those guys they're all right they're not my like favorite stock photo models of all time but they yeah. got the job done no i understand it's it's the the eternal struggle of the author trying to find people who like even remotely closely represent what you see. <laughs> when you were, so you recorded this story for the show, um, or are in the process of recording some of it. Um, have you, did you have any like realizations or notable thoughts or anything curious that stood out to you while you were reading it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I did mostly, <laughs> well, I, I must have re-recorded the first chapter like a bunch of times, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I think my biggest realization was how kind of like square Wesley is in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just so awkward. Like there's a scene. Oh no. Oh, it just gives me like realizations. But when I think back to writing Ether Witch, I was kind of like, what was I thinking? If, like, I can't even say because it's a spoiler. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so there's a scene when he's talking to Lucian at the nightclub. And um, if you read the prequel, you won't really think anything of Lucian Alexander because he's just kind of mm. an almost an extra in, in the book that comes in. But he's actually a pretty big character in Ether Witch. And uh, when he's having a very specific conversation with Lucian uh, about um, a play party, we'll just say, <laughs> it's just so funny to me <laughs> because Wesley is so awkward and his partner, Ruby, I wish I would have brought her into the rest of mm. the series, but she was working in Denver, not Mountain Shadow, so I couldn't really do that. But Ruby, as you'll find out, is just like much more worldwide yes. than Wesley and it's 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 funny I could almost write a series with just those two solving crimes yeah the odd hilarious. couple yeah they yeah. were great I really <laughs> liked her I thought you're I mean I thought all of your characters were great in this story but I really loved your female characters um Ruby and Morgan were excellent even um Letitia Letitia um Letitia yeah Letitia. she she was like I like her because hilarious. she's interesting. She was interesting, <laughs> but like this whole sushi scene was just I was just like cracking up as I'm just imagining this vampire <laughs> with her like pet. <laughs> yeah, the the scene of the sushi restaurant was fun to write for many reasons, um, especially after it kind of goes south. Uh, I had to get really <laughs> creative with the different ways to kill people. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of my favorite things about writing vampires is kind of imagining all the ways that they could be creatively killed, like mm -hmm. if you don't have stakes handy. So, yeah. So do the hunters have, um, because vampires it are like very strong and fast, it seemed like in your world and usually in general, but are hunters also, do they have like the extra physical abilities? They do. Hunters are extra fast, extra strong, um, but they are mortal. Sorry. Um, okay. Would you, what like uh, content rating would you give this? Um, I was feeling like PG-13. Uh, there is a love scene, but it's not super explicit. Um, there's like... Yeah, I'm thinking I would give it like a PG-13 plus. I don't know. I don't know what it would be rated. <laughs> I don't know what it would truly be rated because there's some pretty explicit stuff that's widely available these days. With I know. And that's why it was hard. I was like, maybe like a show that's on FX, it would be equivalent to. Um, so I will say, if you're concerned about the love scene, I did not have to think of any creative or any 
synonyms, awkward synonyms for the word penis. So yeah. there's none of that. It's not graphic. Um, it, it is, yeah, it's, it is complete, but it is not graphic. I will say that like compared to the stuff that I'm I writing for my I write God, it is spicy not, scenes. It is very classy. <laughs> It is not graphic <laughs> at all compared to what I've been writing lately. Super not graphic. <laughs> yeah, there's, you know, this is the one book of the series that I did not give my 96 year old granny to read all the other books in Mountain Shadow she has read. Although I have put sticky notes in front of chapters, like just skip this chapter. You won't miss anything except <laughs> the dirty bits. Um, but I did not give her blood ties because it was just it's too big of a risk if she yeah. took that sticky note off and read that chapter. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and there's a lot of like supernatural violence and stuff and it is like a murder. I mean, he's a cop. He's a, uh, uh, detective major crimes, major detective. crimes. Thank you. I was like strange crimes. No major crimes detective. Um, <laughs> so there's a couple of murders that he's solving and he goes to the crime scenes and stuff. So, there, there is, but it's not like super, again, not, it's like he looks at it very clinically. So I would say that like, if anybody, I don't, I don't feel like it's triggering to anybody for, I mean, I don't think it would be. Um, there is like some BDSM stuff, but only through Wesley's like really awkward perspective, which is so <laughs> funny. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, you are in the process of a complicated release of the sixth book of the series, um, but it will be yes. available widely to everybody on the 6th of June. Yes, the sixth and final book in the main series will be available 6-6, six, six, so 6-6 six, <laughs> six for book six. Um, but right now on my website, I am offering a special bundle where you get book six and another prequel novella, this one from Fiona's perspective, you get both of those for the price of the regular ebook, only available on my website. And then June 6th on the main release, that deal just disappears. And so, um, but you can also pre-order the sixth book from Amazon and all the other retailers right now and get the prequel novella for free. The other, not Blood Ties, but the Witch's Fortune prequel novella. So sweet. Yeah. But you can get all those, you can, the entire series is available on my website, tarabenner.com. Awesome. Is there anything else that you would like to leave listeners with? No, nope. I'm just excited for you to come into my world. So, yeah. yay. Okay. Well, uh, let's dive into the story. The zing of black coffee couldn't mask the taste of homicide in the morning. Walking into a house where someone had been murdered felt different from walking onto the scene of an accident, overdose, or suicide. There was always a certain coldness and a sense of disorder, something the killer had left behind. There was also a taste, Wesley thought, stale and coppery like blood. The Vic was slumped on the leather sectional with his shirt hanging open and his pants around his ankles. The dregs of some honey-colored liquor gleamed in the early morning light coming in through the sliding glass door. It refracted in the crystal tumbler like light through a prism throwing rainbow beams over the coffee table. The floor glittered with shards of glass, and there was a puddle of liquid by the arm of the couch. The condo's furnishings were what one would expect for a bachelor pad. Expensive leather couch, Scandinavian sideboard, and a giant flat screen mounted to the wall. The place had wide planked hardwood floors stained a dark gray, and the sort of bland modern art that didn't command any attention. The open kitchen was barren, hardly used, though there was an espresso machine and a fully stocked bar. The victim was an investment banker for a prestigious firm in the city, single white male, late thirties. It had been his personal assistant who'd found him. Apparently, he'd missed an important video call after a celebratory night out with his co-workers. When he hadn't answered his phone after repeated tries, the assistant had come to investigate. Wesley had gotten the call at 8.30 that morning, less than four hours after he'd collapsed in bed after pulling a double shift. It had been Ruby's voice on the other end of the line. She'd been slogging through the double right beside him, but Ruby never sounded tired. She had already been on scene when Wesley had arrived at the swanky high-rise in Lower Downtown. 
She was freshly showered and dressed in her normal black suit with a hot pink blouse underneath. Ruby wore the same shade of pink for lipstick. The color popped against her dark skin and made her seem more approachable than most detectives. Ruby caught Wesley's eye under one of the layered chunks of her hair that swooped down on one side. Judging from the look on her face, this was definitely a homicide. She was speaking to the assistant who'd found the body. She was dressed in a gray pencil skirt and her eyes were puffy from crying. Ruby thanked the woman and strode over to Wesley, careful not to disturb the shards of broken glass. Eric Peckman, she said without breaking stride, 38, single, never married, unless you count being married to your job. He was working in a financial advisory firm called Egan and Associates. What's your feel on the assistant? Wesley asked. She's still in shock. I think she was as surprised as anyone that her boss turned up dead. His cell will confirm that he had a meeting and that she tried to reach him. Cause of death? Ruby sighed. We won't know for sure until the autopsy results come back, but it looks to me like his neck was broken. Wesley cocked his head to the side, examining the odd angle of the victim's chin. As far as he could tell, Ruby was right. The slump of his head was all wrong. He also had a dozen or so marks across his abdomen, straight lines two or three inches long. At that moment, there was a flurry of movement out in the hallway, and Ruby turned and put on her game face to usher the crime scene techs inside. Come on in, she called. Watch your step. I want everything in here photographed. Spend some extra time in the bedroom. Our Vic might have been entertaining a guest. Ruby drifted off to direct the crime scene with the bossiness of a wedding planner. He heard her muffled admonishments drifting from the bedroom before she reemerged wearing an exasperated expression. Children, all of them, she mumbled, disturbing her bangs with a weary sigh. How many times do I have to say, don't touch that? Wesley cracked a grin. He was secretly grateful that Ruby liked to take charge. He'd been with the Denver PD for almost eight years, and major crimes for five of those, but he'd only made detective a few months back and sometimes felt like it was his first day on the job. I want to talk to these wolves of Wall Street he went out with last night, said Ruby, before they have a chance to talk to one another and get their story straight. You think one of them had something to do with this? I don't know, but our guy definitely had a guess last night. Ruby gestured down to the victim's naked lower half and the pool of liquid on the floor. It looked like bourbon. With a little luck, they'll be able to pull DNA from one of those glasses. Maybe they can pull DNA from the body, said Wesley, crouching down to get a good look at the victim. If he had been mid-coitus when he was killed, the perpetrator had likely left hair, saliva, or some other evidence on the body. Pulling a palm-sized flashlight out of his pocket, Wesley shined it on the victim's neck. At first, he thought he'd been looking at a hickey, but then he realized it was something else. We need to talk to the last few women he dated, he said. You think one of them was involved? Wesley shrugged. Could be. At the very least, they'd be able to tell us whether Peckman liked to get rough. Nobody likes it this rough, said Ruby. Wesley could feel her giving him a look, but he hadn't glanced up from the victim's neck. No, he said, but take a look at this. He moved to the side so Ruby could get a better look at the nasty mark on the victim's neck. It looked like rope burn, except the neck was bruised, a hard purple line where he'd been strangled. Wesley was already hunched over the bar when Gabriel pulled up in a shiny black Audi. Wesley didn't recognize the car, but he knew it had to be Gabriel's. His brother traded his vehicles more often than some people washed their jeans, but he always drove up in something sporty with tinted windows and fresh shine on the tires. Teller's was a good old neighborhood standby. It wasn't quite a dive bar, but it wasn't trendy. They didn't brew their own beer or make artisanal cocktails, and the food they served came in red plastic baskets. It was the kind of place with branded neon beer signs, bartenders who suffered no fools, and the comforting warmth of a polished oak bar top that called to the working man like a siren. It wasn't where the rest of the force liked to hang out, but it was about as far north as he could coax Gabriel for a drink. Gabe thought that developers had all but ruined everything north of I-70, and he had an unnatural hatred of the Patagonia-clad mountain bikers that filled the breweries up there. The moment Gabriel walked into the bar, Wesley felt a slight tingle along the back of his neck. It wasn't a twin thing. It was a Gabe thing. He had a natural energy that repelled some and drew in others, the others mostly being women. 
You've got some catching up to do, said Wesley, when he felt Gabriel pass behind him. I think I can manage, said his brother, sliding into the seat beside him. The bartender appeared as if by magic, the way all good bartenders do. She swept away Wesley's empty bottle and replaced it with a fresh one. Johnny Walker Black, Gabe said to the bartender. Better make it a double. Gabriel was dressed in a pair of relaxed fit jeans and a white Henley shirt with the sleeves rolled up. His hair was darker than Wesley's and had grown out a bit since they'd last seen each other. It hung down around his ears in straight, choppy locks. On most people, it would have looked unkempt, but Gay was pulling it off. Killians, he said, catching sight of Wesley's drink. Feeling sorry for ourselves, I see. Wesley's lip curled, but he said nothing. Killians had been their dad's beer of choice. Maybe he did order it whenever he was missing him, or looking for answers at the bottom of a bottle. It's been a while, said Gabriel in an offhand voice. I trust my tax dollars are hard at work. Oh yeah, said Wesley, tipping back his beer and taking a long, deliberate swig. It wasn't Gabe's fault that they'd hardly hung out since Wesley had made detective. He'd gotten so busy that they'd fallen out of the habit of catching a game or meeting up for drinks. But they were brothers, and in the time it took Gabriel to sit down, order, and judge Wesley's drink choice, they'd fallen into their old, comfortable ease. New car? Yeah. A couple of loud guys were migrating over to the bar, and Gabe leaned back and stretched his arms, trying to take up as much room as possible. I got a smoking deal on that one. Plus, I always felt a little silly plugging in my Tesla. Wesley snorted, nodding faintly as he stared down at the wet ring on his coaster. What's with you? Gabe asked, bringing the tumbler of whiskey toward him and taking a sip. It's just this case I'm working on. Gabriel made a face as the drink hit the back of his throat, and he swallowed with a slight, satisfied hiss. His thick black eyebrows knitted together as he looked at Wesley. Want to talk about it? Wesley hesitated. He didn't want to talk about it. He wanted to forget about homicide just for one night. But no matter how he tried to distract himself, he couldn't. TV didn't do the trick. Neither did booze. At times, the need to escape was so acute that he probably would have tried something other than alcohol if he didn't have to pass a drug test for work. Maybe that was why he'd called Gabe. His brother could be a dick sometimes, but he knew how to have a good time. I was called in to investigate a homicide today, he said. The guy was a 38-year-old investment banker at the top of his game. How did he die? Wesley sucked in a breath. We're still waiting on the results, but it looks as though his neck was broken. Gabriel's frown deepened. Any leads? Wesley shook his head and took another swig. He swallowed and set his beard down lightly, his throat scratchy from the carbonation. We think it was a woman. He was found with his pants down, ligature marks on his neck, and they pulled traces of lipstick off the body. Gabriel raised one wicked eyebrow, a trick Wesley had never mastered. Wow, that's how I want to go. Wesley shot him a sidelong look. I'm serious, said Gabe, catching the bartender's attention. Fuck me hard, kiss me sweet, and kill me quick and clean. Gabe, a man is dead. I know. I'm sorry. He was already regretting his decision to share details of the case with Gabriel. To his brother, it was like working out who did it on a cop show he was watching. To Wesley, this was his life, day in and day out. It wasn't as simple and clean as pointing at the screen and saying, it's the fiance, or I bet the neighbor did it. It was damn hard work and endless dead ends. The pool of potential suspects was practically infinite, and the evidence was rarely clear cut. It didn't come with the satisfaction of a big reveal where everything suddenly made sense. Sometimes the perp got away. We'll drink up, said Gabriel, as the bartender sauntered over to pour him another drink. One for my brother, if you don't mind. He's bumming me out with all his talk of murder. The bartender gave Gabe an odd look, but gamely brought out another glass. Wesley quirked an eyebrow. You're paying, right? I just bought a new car. I'm a civil servant, and I thought you got a smoking deal. Gabe rolled his eyes and glanced at the bartender. Yeah, keep him coming. I guess I'm paying. Chapter 2. Gabriel. It was nearly midnight by the time Wes passed out on the old plaid couch in his living room. His light brown hair was mussed in the back, and he'd changed from his wrinkled button-up to a t-shirt and sweats before collapsing. 
His sidearm lay within reach on the coffee table. It had taken three bars and five women coming up to talk to him for me to realize that he wasn't really up for a good time. I wasn't sure what it was about this case that had put him in such a dark place. In the last few months, he'd worked the case of a nursing student they found strangled in five points, the stabbing of a single mother, and the shooting of a retired police officer. As part of the Major Crimes Division, Wesley had dealt with some pretty dark shit. This case seemed almost tame by comparison, but it was obvious that something was eating him. Once Wes was comfortably snoring on the couch, I wandered into the sad little kitchen and opened the fridge. Its contents were probably typical for a single cop. Beer, styrofoam takeout containers, some questionable leftovers in plastic Tupperware, and half a gallon of expired milk. The colonel, his psychotic German shepherd, let out a forlorn whine. He was sitting on the grubby yellow tile with his metal food bowl between his paws, and I wondered if Wes had come home after work to feed him. Oh, now you want to be cool, I said to the dog, remembering how he'd snapped his jaws at me between the door and the jam the last time I'd come over unannounced. I'll help you out just this once, but you remember who your friends are next time. The colonel had come from the canine unit, but he'd flunked out of police dog training for being too aggressive. Wesley, bleeding heart that he'd always been, scooped up the vicious flea bag and brought him home as a pet. The dog still didn't have a friendly bone in his body. Opening up the pantry to search for dog food, I found a jumbo bag of kibble with the picture of a wolf on the side. I dragged it out and shoveled a scoop into the colonel's food bowl, feeling his predatory gaze on me the entire time. To the colonel's credit, he didn't move a muscle or make a sound while I poured. He just sat there looking regal and menacing, like he might take my arm off if I tried to move the bowl half an inch in any direction. And chow, I said, as I'd heard Wesley do. On cue, the colonel bounded to his feet and began wolfing down the kibble so forcefully that the bowl slid across the floor. I tucked the dog food back inside, shaking my head at the pitiful selection of human sustenance. If the pantry was any indication, Wes was surviving on cereal, cup noodles, and spray cheese in a can. I wasn't sure how a 30-year-old man lived like this, but Wesley had always given himself fully to the job. If he put half as much energy into a relationship as he put into his work, maybe he could meet a nice girl, settle down, and pop out some rugrats. That was what he really wanted. Although, I thought darkly, Wesley would never keep any girl that got within ten feet of this place. Everything from the contents of his pantry to the battered frat house furniture told the story of a guy who couldn't take care of himself, much less anybody else. That wasn't the case, but that was how it looked. Wesley wasn't hurting on money, because he never spent any. He stayed fit and lean because he barely stopped working long enough to eat. If he'd been slightly less committed to the job, he might have knocked off work early now and then to go to the grocery store or buy a grown man's couch. Casting one last glance over at Wesley, I grabbed my keys off the counter and left. It was a full moon that night, which meant that supernaturals would be out in full force. I had already lost time to brotherly bonding, and I needed to get going if I hoped to pick up the trail of the lone werewolf I had been tracking. Nobody, not even Wes, knew what I did after hours. Wes and I might have been twins, but he was a mortal and I was a hunter, sired by another man. You see it in dogs all the time. A dog gives birth to one pup that looks like the colonel, and another that's basically a Labrador. Among humans, it's a fleetingly rare occurrence called superfecundation. Wes didn't know that we were only half-brothers. Neither did Wesley's father, I imagine. Besides our easily dismissible differences in looks and personality, I was born with a supernatural drive to track and kill any magical being that harmed mortals or upset the natural balance. Wesley was not. Wes had no idea what I did what I really was. My cover as a rare weapons dealer paid all right, but it wasn't nearly as lucrative as the bounties on some of the really dangerous supernaturals I'd eliminated over the years. Power-hungry witches, rogue goblins, and even a stray demon or two. Not that I did it for the money. A hunter's drive was pure instinct, like the colonel's urge to rip my throat out and pee on every tree he passed. I hopped in my car parked outside Wesley's house and listened appreciatively to the hum of the engine. Despite what I told Wesley, I hadn't traded the Tesla by choice. I had totaled it two weeks prior in a high-speed chase with a dark elf on a motorcycle. It was a major bummer. I never could have afforded that car, but the Brotherhood had given it to me as a bonus. Being a hunter had some perks, but these were offset by the life of secrecy and the sky-high insurance premiums.
Pulling it onto the empty street, I took Colfax Avenue to I-25 and headed north. Wesley lived in Lincoln Park, but I had been tracking what was undeniably werewolf activity from Five Points to the river. If it dipped below I-70 again, I planned to be there to kill it. I exited the highway and found a quiet street between the railroad tracks and a parking garage where no one was likely to wander over. Once parked, I killed the engine, turned on my police scanner, and waited with excitement. You didn't see a werewolf every day, even in my line of work. Although the state of Colorado had one of the highest populations of werewolves per capita, werewolves mostly kept to themselves. They could live normal lives most of the time, but during the full moon, they had no control over the change. To keep from hurting anyone, most chained themselves up to wait it out or spent that time roaming the mountains and plains far away from any humans. Unless a mortal actually saw a werewolf turn, the only dead giveaway was a were's tendency to disappear once a month to go fishing or camping, which in Colorado was not all that unusual. As a hunter, I could usually smell any werewolf within a quarter mile radius, but that wasn't how I planned to catch it. If it was prowling around near the bars on a Friday night, someone was bound to call it in. When they turned, werewolves looked like giant wolves, but in this part of the country, they are more often mistaken for bears or mountain lions. The police didn't usually do anything about bear sightings, but one near such a crowded nightlife spot wouldn't be ignored for long. I was pretty sure that this wolf was the same one that had mauled and killed a hiker in Rocky Mountain National Park the month before. Werewolves didn't feed on people, but, like any animal, they could be lethal if provoked or caught by surprise. I'd also heard from other hunters about a rise in lupine virus, a strain of werewolf rabies that made wares exceptionally aggressive and eventually killed them. If the wolf was rabid, that would explain why it had been cast out of its pack. The attack in the national park had been blamed on a mountain lion, but the prints and bite marks weren't right for a big cat. The tracks were classically a wolf, and I'd caught a whiff of the stink it had left behind when I'd visited the park. The night before, two neighborhood cats and an Alaskan Malamute had been killed in the area. I suspected the wolf was expanding its territory. Sure enough, not 20 minutes after I'd been parked, officers were dispatched to a warehouse-style brew pub on the corner of Brighton and 35th Street, a couple of blocks off the main drag. Someone had reported a large bear in the area. Starting the car, I sped down the deserted road along the tracks and cut down to the area in question. I parked a block away and killed the engine, consulting the built-in GPS map. I swore. There was a police station two blocks down and two blocks over. It wouldn't take them long to dispatch officers to the scene if they weren't prowling the streets already. I'd have to work fast to beat them to the wolf. Getting out of the car, I pulled on my thick leather jacket, useful protection against bites and scrapes. I grabbed a heavy black bag out of the trunk, which contained a leather collar, muzzle, and chain. Then I bent to inspect my weapons and the soft glow of the trunk light. If I couldn't be sure the wolf was the same that had killed that human and it wasn't infected with lupine virus, I'd be forced to take it in alive. That wasn't exactly how I wanted to spend my Friday night, but killing an innocent werewolf was a good way to start a war. Putting down a werewolf once it had turned wasn't ideal. It took three or four shots with a high-caliber silver bullet to take one out of commission. I liked guns as much as the next guy, but firearms weren't usually a hunter's weapon of choice. For one thing, they were loud. They were also useless against vampires, and an exceptionally skilled witch could stop a bullet in its tracks and redirect it at the shooter. Not good. But for a werewolf, a double-barreled shotgun was my best, worst option. This piece had belonged to my grandfather on my mother's side, and I had created my own custom wolf-killing ammo. They were ordinary recycled shotgun shells filled with silver pellets. If I could wound the wolf, I'd be able to get close enough to kill it. I had my Smith & Wesson loaded with custom 44 Magnum cartridges as backup. Closing the trunk, I walked around the car and moved swiftly toward the area where the bear had been spotted. I tried to stay out of the orange pools of light cast by the street lamps, but the full moon was so bright that anyone in the vicinity would be able to see me. Luckily, there were no people milling around Brighton Boulevard at that hour. I passed a coffee bar, an office building, and an art gallery, but all their windows were dark. Moving silently down the sidewalk, I took careful note of which shops had exterior surveillance cameras. The footage would have to be dealt with in the morning. That part was important. As soon as I rounded the corner, I knew at once that the werewolf had been there. I could smell wet dog mixed with the sour stench of hot breath. 
I dropped my bag on the sidewalk and continued to move, sticking to the shadows when possible. I could hear the throb of blood in my ears, but was reassured by the weight of the pistol against my leg. I reached a desertist tapas bar and sensed a supernatural nearby. Just then, I heard a low, menacing growl and saw a flash of movement in the window. Turning, I caught a brief flicker of yellow eyes before the werewolf lunged. I leapt to the side as a huge mass of fur came flying toward me, narrowly missing its claws. Supernatural speed and strength were traits all hunters shared, but werewolves were fast too. The wolf landed in front of the tapas bar, jaws snapping as it whipped around to face me. It was small for a werewolf and looked slightly starved, definitely unhealthy. The wolf lunged again, and I wasn't as quick. The two of us collided. The werewolf knocked me to the ground, but I thrust the butt of my shotgun into its chest to keep it from tearing it in my throat. The gun wedged between us like a brace, but it wouldn't hold the wolf for long. I could feel the rumble of a growl work its way down thick, hairy forelegs, and I felt the hot drip of saliva on my face. Long ropes of spit trailed from its jowls. The wolf was definitely rabid. A rabid werewolf upped the stakes, but it also filled me with resolve. There was no need to capture the thing alive to confirm that it was the wolf who'd killed that hiker. Infected wolves had to be put down. Holding the werewolf at a distance with my foot, I whipped the butt of my shotgun around to smack it in the snout. The wolf let out a yelp of pain, and I managed to push myself across the pavement and wriggle out from under it. I flipped my shotgun around and fired. The kick would have knocked me back if I hadn't been lying on the ground. Instead, it just rebounded against me with the force of a small cannon. An unearthly yelp echoed off the buildings, awful enough to draw every mortal within a half-mile radius. The wolf darted away but didn't go far. I could still hear it pawing at the pavement. Scrambling to my feet, I cast around for the wolf and found it hulking in the moonlight. Its tawny fur was slick with blood, and its ears were pinned to its head. It lunged at me again, but I slipped to the side, its fur brushing against my sleeve. I wheeled around and fired again. The wolf stumbled with a whimper, but then it lurched to its feet. Its snout seemed to shorten as it bared its teeth, two enormous rows of white fangs. The wolf lunged again, but I dodged it easily, drawing my pistol from its holster. Sorry about this, I said, taking aim. I caught one last snarling glare before shooting it between the eyes. My shot echoed on the empty street, and I knew immediately that I made the kill shot. The werewolf dropped to the ground like an old fur coat its limbs twitching as it died. Its filthy, bloodied pelt gleamed in the moonlight, and a few seconds later, it began to change. A were couldn't hold its wolf form once the ether left its body. Ether was the animating life force of all living things, and supernaturals had it in spades. I blinked, slightly disoriented from watching the change, and by the time my vision cleared, a naked man was lying in the street. He was thin and gaunt and riddled with wounds. I could hear sirens off in the distance. Then came the hard part of any hunt, extricating the body from the scene without getting waylaid by the police. That would certainly be tough to explain the next time I saw my brother. Jogging down the street to where I dropped my bag, I pulled out straps and a black canvas sheet. Spreading it out next to the werewolf, I rolled his body onto the canvas and wrapped him like a burrito. Then I raced back to my car and whipped down the street for an easier pickup. It was tough to find a sports car with adequate trunk space. The Audi's was deep but not very wide, so I had to wedge the body nose to knee to get it to fit. It would have been next to impossible once rigor mortis set in. I made a mental note to remember that for next time. I was just pulling the privacy cover when a police cruiser rolled up. Damn it. The officer inside flashed his lights, and I slammed the trunk closed. The cruiser stopped about 15 yards away, and I raised a hand in greeting. I cast around on the ground to locate my shells and bullet casings, but there was no time to retrieve them. The officer got out and raised his weapon, blinding me with the beam of his scope. Police, he yelled unnecessarily. Drop your weapons and step away from the vehicle. Slowly, I took the pistol out of my holster and laid it on top of my car. Then I took two steps away and raised my hands overhead. My heart thudded dully against my ribcage. This wasn't the first time I'd been caught up by law enforcement, but it was always a bit unnerving. Spook the wrong hair trigger cop, and a hunter could end up six feet under. We weren't impervious to bullets. Evening, officer, I called. The beam of light started to move, and I knew the cop was advancing. Behind him, I could see the shadow of another officer. It was always harder when there were two of them. Seeing that I was unarmed, the officer lowered his weapon. 
He eyed me critically and gazed toward my vehicle, shining his light inside. He could probably see the shotgun lying across the back seat, but that wasn't illegal in Colorado. What are you doing out here? He asked, blinding me once again with his light. I gestured behind me. Just checking on my building. I lived nearby, and I thought I heard gunshots. The officer glanced at the storefronts behind me and then back to me. He still looked wary, but I caught a small flicker of doubt in his eyes. Which business is yours? The tapas bar, I lied. The officer nodded slowly but didn't drop his dubious expression. The other policeman was approaching slowly, looking more alert than his partner. The first cop sighed. Can I see some ID? Sure thing, I said, reaching into my back pocket. I could hear the scuff of the second officer's footsteps as he shined a light on the ground. If he found the casings, I was screwed. They'd realize I was the one who'd been shooting. Clearing my throat, I handed over my license. It had my real name and everything. There wasn't much point in a fake identity. Hunters were skilled at getting out of legal snafus and covering up evidence of supernatural activity. Thought you said you lived in the area, said the officer, frowning at my address. I've been staying with a friend. The policeman gave me a raised eyebrow look, but then he caught sight of my name. Pierce, he mumbled. Any relation to Wesley Pierce? He's my brother, I said, cracking a smile. Maybe it wouldn't be so hard to talk myself out of this after all. I didn't know he had a brother. The man looked up. What's it called? What's what called? Your restaurant. I swallowed to wet my dry throat. It was something in Spanish. That much I remembered. The sign was right behind me, but I couldn't exactly turn to look. We're kind of going through a rebrand, I choked. But that moment of hesitation cost me. Hey, O'Connell, called the other police officer, who was still shining his light on the ground. Check this out. Shit. He'd found a pool of werewolf blood and several smears on the ground. At that moment, I knew my luck had run out. I had no other choice. With lightning-fast reflexes, I shot out a hand, capturing O'Connell by the arm. In the split second before he reached for his weapon, his light gray eyes locked on mine. You didn't see me here tonight, I said, holding his gaze with a firm look. You don't even know Wesley Pierce has a brother. You responded to reports of gunfire, but found nothing on Brighton Boulevard. O'Connell's face had gone very pale, but he didn't reach for his weapon. His throat bobbed as he nodded mutely and turned to walk back toward the cruiser. At the sound of footsteps, his partner turned, and in a flash, I was right in front of him. The second officer jerked up his pistol, but I locked eyes with him and held his gaze. Lower your weapon. I felt some resistance. Beads of sweat sprang up above the officer's lip, and I saw the muscles of his face twitch as my demand penetrated his consciousness. Lower your weapon, I repeated, more firmly this time. A hunter's power of suggestion wasn't nearly as strong as a vampire's, and some mortals had more resolve than others. But inevitably, I wore him down, and he slowly lowered the pistol. I was never here, I said. You didn't see me. You didn't see anyone when you came to investigate. You won't come looking again. When a hunter encountered resistance like that, it was important to cover all bases. Suspicious minds had tricky ways of circumventing the power of suggestion, and if it was done sloppily, a mortal might remember events he'd been told to forget. The officer nodded. Get back to your car. My heart rate began to slow as the officer turned toward the cruiser. I stood frozen until the car pulled away and let out a slow breath of relief. It was time to clean up any evidence of the werewolf and make it look as though I was never there. Chapter 3 Wesley it was late morning when Wesley got the call. His cell phone buzzed loudly on the glass top of the coffee table, a sound that seemed to rattle his skull. He opened his eyes and immediately regretted it. Sunlight was streaming in through the open blinds, flooding his living room with unforgiving daylight. He couldn't remember the last time he'd spent the night passed out on someone's couch, much less his own, and he could feel the texture of the rough woven surface imprinted on his cheek. Reaching for his phone before the vibration skittered it out of reach, he accepted the call and brought it to his ear. Pierce. Morning, sunshine, came Ruby's brisk voice. Did I wake you? It's Saturday, Wesley grumbled. And yes. He sat up on the couch and rubbed one crusty eye with the heel of his hand. Saturday was his day off. Not that he really ever got a day off working major crimes. Long night with Gabe last night. Ah, that explains it. Well, don't shoot the messenger, but we've got another one. They need us down at the scene. Another one what? 
Another probable homicide. This one was a surgeon. A surgeon? Wesley repeated, slightly dumbfounded. Most of the homicides he worked were either gang-related or the result of domestic violence. A surgeon was unusual. Down at Rose Medical. Looks a lot like our Vic from yesterday. I'll be right there, said Wesley. I just need to jump in the shower. See you there. Half an hour later, Wesley pulled up in the emergency lane, freshly showered and on his second cup of coffee. There were already four patrol officers on the scene, and the guys who worked security for the hospital looked as though Christmas had come early. Restraining the occasional tweaker was the most action these security guards ever saw. Securing the scene of a homicide was an exciting deviation from their normal routine. They nodded at Wesley as he flashed his credentials, barely managing to conceal their eagerness to participate. He joined Ruby, who was talking to the hospital administrator, a dark-haired woman in her late fifties wearing dark slacks and a gray silk blouse. The administrator looked as though she'd barely slept, and her face was lined with stress. Homicide couldn't be good for optics, and she was probably worried how she was going to explain this to the hospital board. I just don't understand who would want to kill him. We're doing everything we can to get to the bottom of this, said Ruby. In the meantime, I'm going to need you to call Wilson. The administrator nodded and turned to leave just as Wesley joined them. What I miss, he asked. Ruby sighed. Security footage was a bust. There's a whole chunk of footage from midnight to three that's just gone. Erased. Erased by whom? It had to be the security personnel on duty. Or we're looking at a cyber attack, but that seems like an awfully big coincidence. I assume this Wilson was the guard on duty? Ruby nodded. He got off around six this morning. Whatever might have gone down last night, I'm guessing he knows something. What did go down last night? Ruby motioned for Wesley to follow, leading him out of the lobby. The Vic's name is Cullen McCann. He was a surgeon here. One of the custodians found him dead in the on-call room a few hours ago. Ruby led Wesley back to the room where the surgeon's body had been discovered. A twin bed was jammed up against one wall, covered in scratchy-looking hospital linens. A faux wood nightstand sat beside it, holding a lamp and a cheap plastic alarm clock. Colin McCann was slumped on top of the blankets, dressed only in a pair of boxer briefs. His scrubs lay discarded in a heap on the floor, but his cell phone and wallet were on the nightstand. His eyes were still open, and his head lolled to the side. Something about the position of the body seemed all too familiar to Wesley. His neck's been broken, said Ruby grimly. Same ligature marks and contusions as Eric Peckman. The autopsy report on him came back this morning. And? Peckman didn't die by asphyxiation. His spinal cord had been severed. The medical examiner said that the marks on his stomach could have been made by a whip, and there was DNA belonging to a woman. So the killer whips and strangles her victims and then breaks their necks? Assuming the woman and the killer are one and the same. Wesley shook his head. What woman has the strength and ability to break a grown man's neck? The kind that seduces and kills white-collar men. Any DNA match? Her DNA wasn't in the system. They're analyzing the lipstick from the glass now. Wesley raised his eyebrows and let out a breath. Something just didn't feel right. He squinted down at the Vic's arm, where a smudge of red was visible. What's that on his wrist? Some kind of stamp from a bar or a nightclub. I have a couple of academy cadets working on it. You think the security guard is involved? Ruby shrugged. More likely, the killer paid him off or threatened him to delete the footage. Wesley followed her back into the hallway, which was filled with the typical hospital beeps and the sound of gurney wheels on tile. Ruby looked around, lost in thought, and put her hands on her hips. There must be a thousand security cameras in this place. One of them has to have caught something. Wesley glanced back toward the lobby, where the hospital administrator was talking on her cell phone. Her face was strained from the stress of whatever she was saying. Rose Medical Center had an excellent reputation, but this would definitely make the papers. And a headline like, Prominent Surgeon Murdered on Call, would surely be a blow to their recruitment efforts. Ms. Stokes, Ruby called, seeing that the administrator had just finished her phone call. Do you have a record of every staff member who was on call last night? The administrator nodded numbly. Mary Allen can help you with that, she said, pointing at a bank of offices. Ruby gave a curt nod of thanks and exchanged a look with Wesley. They'd been working together long enough to develop their own methods. After one of them felt they'd exhausted a witness, the other would take a stab. Sometimes they didn't learn anything new, but other times it turned up something useful. Miss Stokes, said Wesley, careful to keep his distance in case she could smell last night's alcohol seeping through his pores. Brenda. Wesley pulled a weak smile. 
Do you mind if I ask you a few more questions? I already told the detective everything I could think of, she huffed, looking more exhausted than annoyed. That's all right. It would help me get up to speed, if you don't mind going through it again. Judging from the look on her face, Brenda did mind, but she gave a resigned sort of nod. Wonderful. Wesley pulled a notepad from his suit pocket and slowly located a pen. Could you tell me a bit about Dr. McCann? Well, as I told your partner, Cullen was very well respected. Patients liked him. He was an expert at laparoscopic surgery. He did a lot of mastectomies. So he treated cancer patients. She nodded. A lot of women owe him their lives. Despite her description of the late surgeon, Brenda's tone was clipped and frosty. Wesley couldn't tell if it was her annoyance with him or contempt for Dr. McCann that he was detecting. Throwing caution to the wind, Wesley said, It sounds as though you may have felt differently about Dr. McCann. Brenda's eyebrows knitted together, and her mouth tightened into a line. It seemed that Wesley was on the right track, though she didn't want to admit it. Please, Miss Stokes. Brenda. Anything you can tell us could help us solve this case. He almost added expeditiously to entice the overstressed administrator, but that was always a gross exaggeration when it came to police work. Brenda nodded slowly, seeming to decide it was for the best. Cullen was popular with patients and colleagues, but decidedly less popular with the rest of the staff. Like all surgeons, he had an ego, and he sometimes acted as though he ran the place. He snapped at the nurses. He was a terror to the residents. He treated the techs like garbage. Now they were getting somewhere. Anyone in particular? Wesley asked. Brenda gave him a deadpan look. I have a file this thick full of complaints from nurses. She held her fingers an inch apart. I'll need to have a look at that, said Wesley. But do you know if he had a conflict with anyone who was working last night when he was on call? Cullen wasn't on call last night. He wasn't? Brenda shook her head. Why didn't you share this with Detective Watts? Brenda hesitated for a moment, but then let out a heavy sigh. I didn't want to draw attention to it. I didn't think it was relevant, and I don't want to risk this getting out. It's not fair to Cullen's family to tarnish his reputation when Miss Stokes... If you have information about Dr. McCann, it could help us identify his killer. I doubt that, but if you must know, she stared up at the ceiling with a look of reluctance. I had an inkling that he might be stealing. Stealing? Yes. Wesley could tell she didn't want to talk about it, lest her suspicions prove false. We've recently had quite a few blood bags go missing, she said. More than could have been attributed to simple error. It started about 18 months ago right around the time Cullen joined our staff. When this started happening, we altered our policies to limit access to the lab and take more frequent inventory. The thefts didn't stop. I cross-checked the records of everyone who had access during those periods of time. Cullen was the only commonality. Why would McCann be stealing blood bags? Unfortunately, the black market organ trade is still thriving worldwide. In this country, that means black market transplants, most of which require blood transfusions. Wesley raised an eyebrow. You think McCann was involved in the black market organ trade? I wouldn't go as far as that. I only know about the blood that's gone missing from my hospital since he started working here. Did you ask him about it? What could I say? I didn't have any proof, and I couldn't risk pissing off the best surgeon I had. Just then, a man in polyester slacks and a baggy black security jacket walked through the front doors. He looked remarkably cool and collected for someone who'd been working security when a murder was committed. Maybe nobody had bothered to tell him why he was being called into work. That's Roy Wilson, said Brenda, one of the guards on duty last night. He would have been working the desk when the footage was deleted. It was a mark of how beat down Wesley felt that he called up Gabe after he finished at the crime scene. They had questioned every witness they could reach about the surgeon's death, and he put out a few calls regarding the tip that the good doctor might have been involved in the black market organ trade. The security guard had been a dead end. He hadn't remembered anything odd about his shift, and he claimed not to know how the footage had been deleted. Wesley believed him. Roy Wilson had worn a glassy expression behind his small, mud-colored eyes. Wesley suspected he wasn't the brightest bulb in the box, but his instincts told him the guard wasn't involved in a cover-up. More likely, the killer had drawn the guard away from his post and deleted the footage herself. Wesley didn't think he could stomach the whiff of alcohol, so he and Gabe were meeting at the Silver Bullet shooting range. Gabriel enjoyed his weapons much more than Wesley did, but Wesley had been glad for the suggestion. 
target shooting always helped him clear his head, and it kept him sharp in the field. The silver bullet was housed in a shabby brick building across from a payday loans place. There was a gas station on one side and a laundromat on the other. The giant head of a bald eagle glared down at Wesley from the side of the building. It was painted over the brick facade with a rendering of an American flag. Gabe was leaning against his car when Wesley pulled up in his truck. You look like hell. Thanks to you, said Wesley, leaning into the back seat to get his long gun and ammunition. Don't blame me because you're a lightweight. You've always been a bad influence. Gabriel waggled his eyebrows and pulled the door open. They stepped inside the grungy lobby, which was dominated by a long glass case of pistols. Different colored boxes of ammo lined the shelf behind the counter, and dozens of rifles hung on the wall. The man at the counter was helping another customer, so they hung back to talk. Since you called me up two nights in a row, I'm guessing you're in need of a little more of my tutelage. Wesley flashed a wry grin and clapped his brother on the back. He wasn't going to give Gabe the satisfaction of admitting he was right. It's just nice to blow off some steam every once in a while. They paid their range fees and walked to their lane, and Wesley's trouble seemed to dissolve. The volley of shots echoing down the long concrete walls drowned out his thoughts, and the power reverberating down his arm seemed to center him. As he stepped back from the line to reload, he glanced over at Gabe. Wesley only had his service weapons and a few of their fathers he kept for sentimental value, but Gabriel had a couple dozen firearms that he used on a rotating basis. He didn't open carry in public, but Wesley knew that his brother kept a pistol in the glove box and had weapons concealed all around his apartment. Wesley had always thought he was paranoid, but the darkest corners of his imagination didn't hold a candle to Gabe's. Today, Gabe was shooting his Colt Python with a custom wooden grip. It was a three fifty seven Magnum revolver that looked as though it belonged in an old Western. What is it? Gabriel asked, pulling his earmuffs down. He was still wearing the plastic safety goggles, which was an odd look for Gabe. Wesley sighed. I got called in on another homicide. Same M.O. as the last. You think it's a serial killer? Technically, she would be considered a spree killer. The homicides are too close together. So the killer is a woman. Yep. Wesley tucked his Glock back into his holster and pressed the button to bring his paper forward. Most of the shots were cleanly within the rectangle at center mass. He knew Gabe's groupings would be just as tight. He tore the paper down and put up a fresh one before opening the case for his long gun. So you find out how she chooses her victims, and then you find your killer. That's the trouble, said Wesley. I still have no idea what the victims had in common. They're in different lines of work, they live in different parts of the city, they went to different gyms. So far, I haven't found anything that links them, apart from their age and sex. You will, said Gabe in a reassuring voice. Wesley appreciated the word of confidence, but it didn't ease his mind. Gabriel watched Wesley load the long gun, a hungry look in his eyes. Wesley knew he'd been eyeing the AR-556 at the counter. Maybe he'd let Gabe shoot his. It could be anything that links them, right? asked Gabe. A bank or a grocery store? I suppose. What about after work? I'm guessing the surgeon played a lot of golf. No idea, said Wesley, leaning his rifle on the table and staring through the sights. I'm still waiting on the Vic's credit card statements. That should tell us something. He motioned for Gabriel to put his earmuffs back on and unload a clip into the target. The earmuffs protected his ears, but the shot still reverberated through his ribcage. Wesley straightened up. Come to think of it, the surgeon did have a stamp on the inside of his wrist. It looked like a skeleton key. You ever see a stamp like that? Gabriel was more familiar with the nightlife scene than he was. Gabe shook his head slowly, but his eyes looked distant. Well, it's a start. That and the missing blood bags. Blood bags? Gabriel broke in sharply. Yeah. The hospital administrators at Rose Medical said they've had quite a few go missing, ever since the surgeon started working there. Gabriel nodded, brows drawn together, and Wesley knew he wasn't imagining the slightly frantic look in his eyes. What is it? he asked, studying his brother more carefully. But Gabriel just cracked a grin. Nothing. I think I want to try that AR they had up front. See if I can do better than you. Thanks for listening to the Read by the Author podcast. To find out what happens next in the story, stay tuned for the next episode. Until next time, happy reading!